Most of us are not drinking enough water. It's a fact. You, you there, Mr. Dehydrated Salty person right there, you are not drinking enough water. And there are fantastic new ways to drink water, specifically involving our sponsor for today, AirUp. AirUp is a fascinating new idea on a way to drink way more water. It is a water bottle, specifically with a flavor pod attached to the top. You push this little guy down, it's off. You lift it up and it fills air bubbles into your water with the scent of the delicious option. Whether that is currently here, one of my favorites, watermelon, or the other one we have, good old peach. Take the peach, place it on, bada bing, you got peach flavored water like that. And a reminder, this is just a special flavor pod. There is nothing else in the water. No added sugars, no anything. It is just regular water that tastes different based on the flavor pod you have on top of it. There are also a myriad of different kinds of bottles, different sized bottles, not just that, but all kinds of various flavors. So you can drink water all the time, just water with different flavors, no matter what and no matter where you go. So check out AirUp, link in the description, use code BRICKY10 for 10% off your order and get to drinking way more water. I have never been a completionist. It is never my intention to 100% a game when I play it. There are few, extremely few video games that I've spent my time attempting to fully complete. The list was longer when I was a kid and had a lot more free time, uh, but only games I truly love and want to revisit on a constant occasion I will end up fully completing. Armored Core 6 has joined that very small list. I have S-ranked every single mission, I I have done every single achievement. I have bought every single item in the part shop. It is a game that I have played on my own for myself off stream and with no other intentions outside of simply having a good time. To a lot of you, that might be surprising. Not that I do it, but that it's surprising that I do it. But the world of video game content creation is a fluid one and it's far more content creation than it is video game. And that world moves at a breakneck pace. What I'm trying to say is for me, in, in my world, Armored Core 6 has grabbed me in a way that I never expected it to, and to fully 100% it is a genuine mark for me. It also has given me a bit more of a perspective on the game itself and how it ended up. There's, there's a lot of cover here between the three separate playthroughs, the multiple endings, late game AC building, and the PVP, not to mention some of the balance patches they put it through. But I feel like I have a better understanding of the title than in my initial video. And it's an understanding that has me popping like madman's knowledge because for every single great thing about this game, there is just this singular background figure being a problem. It's that feeling of you were this close to being perfect. You got a 98% on the test, and despite knowing I shouldn't be upset about that, 2%, god damn, it gets in the brain. So, spoilers ahead for everything. And so, what better place to discuss that than the game's surprisingly phenomenal campaign? Armored Core 6 really hits you with more replayability than you'd expect. Now, the campaign is broken up into three total playthroughs, with the third one having the biggest changes. There are three total endings as well, with the first two available to choose from on playthrough one and two, and the third ending being locked behind that final playthrough. Now, initially, I find the axe system to be a really strong point of the game. They're broken down down in pretty solidified chapters that represent the game as a whole. Chapter one is doing odd jobs for Handler Walter and getting a reputation. Chapter two is the introduction of Air, your schizophrenic VTuber, and Carla, the real best girl. Chapter three is dealing with the PCA arrival. Chapter four is the race to the Coral Convergence between the various companies. And finally, chapter five is the Overseer Endgame and Archibus's Rise. They vary in length, but I think it helps set up a lot of the phenomenal presentation and decently paid campaign that they have in store here. A lot of the New Game Plus and New Game Plus 2 missions they give you as well add to that. They are fun, flavorful, and give a lot more context to what you're doing. Where I think a lot of the game shines though is just this feeling of 
epicness that permeates throughout all of it. Even the early missions, like destroying the Rubiconian Strider or, or Operation Wall Climber, have this sense of scale to them and this excitement. And it's one of the reasons why replaying the game feels so damn good, because each mission is short and sweet for, for the most part, but that makes it so that you don't really dread too many of them and you always can replay the really cool parts. I'm sure many of you remember that feeling of replaying an old mission way back just to hear some cool lines of dialogue or fight some really cool boss. And Armor Core 6 has nothing but cool lines of dialogue and cool bosses. Throw in an amazing soundtrack to the mix and you have the best missions in the game. Uh, my personal favorite by a like, country mile is Intercept the Red Guns. It's a painful mission as you are out to assassinate the baller that is G1 Michigan, but it's a mission that is both playful, badass, and decently challenging. Like seeing Balaam with such a fervor behind Michigan and him having this drill sergeant personality, but actually being kind of supportive of his troops, kindness at the same time, it's a great contradiction. I heard that Burke took down gun five at Kwasu. Kwasu? Oh yeah, the deserters who ripped his pants and ran. Albany, I forgot we still kept you around. Kwasu's worth a hundred of you, which means, Albany, the Burke is worth 20 and a half. You're doing nothing productive. Why don't you do the math for us? The answer is 2,000 Albany, sir! Shut your stink on and start shooting! And you know, his name is Commander Michigan. So it felt pretty neat fighting off a genuinely large force of enemies, not just a singular AC. Whoever takes down Gun 13 gets to take home a Balin Cobalt Medal! I got you know, they go real far when you throw them. It's a hard mission, too, because it's not just about stun locking an AC and deleting them from existence like other missions are. There are a couple factors to this one. You know, ammo usage is a huge part of it because of the amount of MTs. Then there is the swarming that you deal with and the constant sound of threat incoming markers on your ear the entire time. Just the never ending beep beep, beep beep, beep beep as grenades fly into your face. Once Michigan actually deploys, I do genuinely feel the difference, like he said. Until the Liger tail deploys, the odds are not in your favor. Before he arrives, it's just a lovely game of whack-a-mole. But post Michigan, I have myself running while trying to shoot what's chasing me. It's a blast of a mission, and it encapsulates Balaam and Michigan in such a fun way. An enjoyable, challenging fight with a good character and great dialogue. Go, go, go! Follow Michigan! On the opposite side of the spectrum, you have the missions that make me feel like the god-awful, money-hungry mercenary that I am. The game is entirely devoid of physical characters outside of a couple pictures. It is nothing but voices in mechs. So why does the Carla and Shaggy fight hurt so much? Let me tell you my motto, tourist. Get your laughs while you can. I don't know what you're up to. When it comes to the three endings, I think Liberator of Rubicon is arguably the best one in terms of just satisfaction overall. The satisfying feeling of the ending and those you fight in it. It just comes at the heartbreak of fighting Carla and best boy Chatty. This is also one of my favorite fights in the game, just for its narrative impact. The general fun I have from Michigan is great, but this one really brings out not only the feels, but a sort of climactic gusto to the game. Like, for starters, the dialogue is fucking great. Is that all you've got? Come on! At least stay for dessert, tourist! Stop with me. I'm getting my laughs while I can. Secondly, it has my personal favorite track in the entire game, Rough and Decent, which is already an amazing track, but this one is the bad joke edit, and it goes hard. Thirdly, it's just a really hard fight. Not only is it pitting you against two ACs, but it's pitting you against them without an immediate health regen capsule. Their fighting style also just puts you on the ropes. Carla is a complete missile boat and was a bane in PvP for a while. Double siege rockets and double suit stores. Fuck you! It just means she fires a ridiculous amount of rockets at you. But weirdly enough, she's super aggressive. Like, she kicks you all the time, which makes zero sense for her build. 
but it makes a ton of sense for her personality. Meanwhile, Chatty does the bizarre floaty bouncy movement all the while raining more missiles and grenades onto your face. I personally think it's the toughest AC fight combo in the game. The only one that holds a candle is the King, Chartreuse, and Raven one, but they're kind of separated in the beginning, so you can kind of deal with one quickly and then go to the other, but it doesn't matter. S tier mission makes me cry. She's dead, tourist. You have made a big mistake. But to go back to the discussion of endings, that is one of those things that I'm, I'm not so sure I feel amazing about. So right, there are three total endings. Fires of Raven, Liberator of Rubicon, and All Mind Simping Iguana Man, something in Latin, I don't, I don't care. I got the Fires of Raven ending first because when it comes to listening to the Schizo VTuber or Carla and Walter who've had my back forever, I chose mom and dad. It took me a while to realize what I had done. Our job is to stop Coral from going everywhere and burning everything up, basically. I mean, okay, it, it, it sounds like preventative, like forest firing. I'm assuming that's kind of their shtick, which considering what, what the fires have done, I'm kind of on board for. Uh, lady, lady in head, I play Warhammer. Burning it all is like my thing. Get him, Carla. Oh God, Carla, watch, oh my, you're good, you're good. Carla, Carla, what is, Carla. Oh, was this, was this the plan all along? Oh, I, I thought, I thought she was like gonna, I was, I was probably talking to you to chat or something. Did I know I was going to blow the planet up? Fires of Rubicon from the core blowing up the first time? Right, the fires of Ibis. Yeah, and so, right, so I guess destroying the coral would, would blow the planet up. Second playthrough, I got the Liberator of Rubicon, and it definitely felt pretty good as the obvious good guy ending. Now, we will get into the uh, morals a little bit later, but it felt more like a classic protagonist style energy. And what I think Liberator does really well is that it gives you the most satisfaction in an ending. While it does really suck turning on Carla, Chatty, and Walter, it's understandable for the story, and it gives you all the most satisfying story beats. His awesome tag team fight with Rusty and his baller soundtrack, you get to put Snail in the ground, and then you have your emotional fights with Carla and especially Walter as the final boss, and my god does it sell the emotion well. It's just the word I keep using. It's just so satisfying. It's satisfying. It, it's rounded out narratively, mechanically, and emotionally fantastic. I think it's the best made ending out of the three by a long shot. Now, Fires of Raven is less satisfying, but still okay. You have chosen the Lol Lamau method and are deciding to recreate the planet destroying Fires of Ibis. You're basically telling your schizo girlfriend, sorry, but your family is weird, I don't get it, so die. It does give you what I'd call the hardest of the three final bosses, fighting Air herself. She's a good fight too. She's fast, intricate, and has the pulse shield in phase one, but not in phase two thing. So you have to really take a well-rounded build and for a lot of people this is a super emotional fight too which i get from the story perspective but i think my understanding of coral being so weak makes it a bit tougher to appreciate like okay Coral is, is a ton of microorganisms that can interact and communicate with one another as well as reproduce very quickly under the right circumstances. It can either be a fuel or also be mixed into machines and power and control them for a long period of time, which is also kind of what a fuel is, but it's slightly different. But in the right, uh, give, 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 me the, give me the Pepe Sylvia, give me the Pepe Sylvia. But in the right, like, amounts or circumstances, it can sort of gain sentience and become a living being more so than before. But also, the Dozer faction on Rubicon uses Korra as a drug, so they're snorting people, but only if it's in large enough quantity of people? Can you keep it down? I'm trying to do drugs. So like, are they actually snorting people, or is it only if there's a large enough contingent of Korra that, that gains sentience, and then, then they're snorting people? You know in Mass Effect, 
Like each individual geth is barely an intelligence, but the bigger geth and geth primes are comprised of lots of intelligences. You've got like five intelligences on a geth trooper, 100 on a prime. Legion is special because he's one geth with a thousand intelligences, which is why he always refers to himself as we and why he's so smart and powerful. I kind of assumed Coral was a similar concept and air is what you get when you are blasted with the giant dose of coral before the Baltius fight, as well as being had the surgery to pilot an AC, which like links coral into your body. And that's how you pilot ACs because you have the surgery and then it uses coral and that lets you hear the voices because other characters like Thumb Dolomayan can hear the voices too because he also got the surgery because he's old gen. But also coral is highly flammable, it would appear, and spreads out at such an insane speed that I will say it's kind of dangerous. The fires of Ibis originally was the burning of the coral, but it didn't all burn. So now Walter and Carla want to recreate that burning, which in turn will most likely genocide the entire population of Rubicon. Let's talk about the mail. Can we talk about the mail, please, Mac? I'm dying to talk about the mail with you all day, okay? Now the PCA wants to contain it and keep the dangerous coral from going out into the stars and populating other planets, but by containing it as they are the Planetary Closure Administration, they're kind of starving out the Rubiconians on this planet and generally kind of being dicks about it. So in Fires of Raven, you go with the Lol Lamau genocide option. In Liberator of Rubicon, you let the coral just kind of do what it does and see what happens. And in All Might Simp Ending 3, you attempt to mix the coral with humanity in this bizarre symbiosis called Coral Release. So it's basically the three Mass Effect endings, Destroy, Control, Synthesis. They're even equipped with the same colors. Fire is red, all mine green. Liberator got that little blue part at the end there. I'm reaching a little bit, but God damn it. You've lost your mind. You've lost your goddamn mind, Charlie. I guess for me, I'm just a little unsure about all of this. Genociding the stars is what I would call like not kosher, but I don't know if I trust this confusing, self-replicating, highly flammable, artificial, but maybe living intelligence to just run amok. And I sure as shit wouldn't trust all mind and AI with the combining of humans and coral together, which is good because you put her in the dirt. Honestly, if the PCA weren't horrible feds who were also ran by an AI where every punishment is death and maybe took a little better care of the Rubiconians, I'd probably side with them. I'm sure at least I'll get a goddamn pension that way. Archibus wants to use the coral for all kinds of horrible purposes and V2 Snail can stay losing. Balaam is unfortunately gone because I would have sided with them immediately for Michigan alone. So yeah, it's just a little bit confusing, at least for me, and I have a smooth brain. And it offers a lot of moral questions. It also creates another annoyance I have that ending three is for the most part, what feels like it's supposed to be the true ending. I know a lot of people don't like calling it the true ending, but it's locked behind three full playthroughs of the game and special choices only available in those playthroughs. So it feels like the true ending, but it's also, in my opinion, the weakest and the least satisfying. Carla and Walter die off screen, which is just unforgivable. And the final fight is really just how hard can that one guy from Balaam mauled? Turns out the answer is pretty fucking hard. I became part of this monster so I can crush you. The final fight's decent. It's generally exciting overall from a gameplay point of view, but it doesn't have that narrative punch. It doesn't have some of the best missions. Uncovering All Mind and all that was neat, but it left me feeling like it's almost a gimmick ending with a villain that I really didn't care much about. Funny Iguana Man is just the saltiest person I've ever seen. And while it's kind of funny to watch, it doesn't do anything for me emotionally. And All Mind is just a power hungry AI, which is a staple of a lot of Armored Core games. So yeah, if I had to rate the ending, it's a clear Liberator, Fires of Raven, and All Mind in that order. I just wish there were more options. I would have liked the situation where Balaam takes over instead of Archivist. I would even like a siding with the PCA option as well. But unless they do dedicated story mode DLC like that, which I don't expect they will, I just don't think it's going to happen. So for now, I'm going to stick with my boy V3 O'Keefe. To me, he's the one that's got it right. On the topic of DLC, 
let's talk builds. I am really happy with how Armored Core 6 has done their best to keep patching the game and allow for a variety of PvP builds to be introduced. In my first video, I talked about how a meta formed, but then from that meta, off meta counterpicks form, and after that, it goes on, so on and so forth. Now, a few patches in, what's good feels like a crapshoot, and it feels awesome when it comes to PvP, that is. Most all parts and equipment seem to have a place, and while some will always float up to the top more than others, it stays varied. For PvE, however, it's a bit of a different story. In order to go around S ranking each of the missions, my build varied a bit until I discovered the number one everything dies build. See, at the start, I played around with all kinds of options, multi-purpose tetrapods, full on missile boats, all kinds of cool things. And for a few of the boss fights, there was a reason to take tons of different options. For All Mind, a full missile boat system was definitely the best, playing keep away while deleting her health bar. For the Ibis series, it was double Gatling gun stun needles, just output more more DPS than they can, and then take over the fight. And for a lot of the AC specific fights, it was the Lance and Pile Bunker combo, killing ACs before they even had a chance to pop a repair kit. But lo and behold, even after everything, even after the nerfs, the one build that had me rip apart the entire game and finalize my S ranks on every mission was double Zim Zams and double laser shotguns. Nothing survived. I was a war crime on legs, no AC, no big boss, Air herself got trounced by this combo. Make no mistake, it is still very good, and it will still carry your trash ass through the campaign like it did for me. It also gave me a realization. There is not enough in terms of parts in this game, which might sound insane from an outside perspective. I mean, like, look at the list of parts. Look at the amount that they have going for them. How could this not be enough? Well, for starters, this is already far less than the other Armored Core games. This might be the best Armored Core game, but it isn't because of the variety of parts. FromSoft went with the Dark Souls 3 method with their weapons. There is a substantial amount of weapons, but there is not a substantial amount of variety in these weapons. Much like in Dark Souls 3, there are a ton of straight swords, but they aren't very different. For example, shoulder missile launchers. There are vertical missiles and horizontal missiles. There are also weights to those missiles and amounts they fire. Some fire two, some six, some 10. This is of course if you want less weight and EN load as the trade-off for less damage. But that still means a huge portion of those shoulder options are just missile launchers. There's nothing unique about them, except that they're smaller and lighter. Now, there are unique missile launchers like the big box one or the container launcher or the horrifying coral launcher that goes But those are not as common as just missile launcher. I feel the same way with the grenade launchers for the hands. Sure, there are types and they have variants, but it's not enough. There is an astronomically larger amount of bipedal legs than there are legs. A crap ton of regular biped, some reverse joint, and only two quad and three tank. And those three tanks aren't even really similar either. Now, argument. Ricky. You say that there's too much redundancy in biped legs, but the three tank legs are very unique, yet you're advocating for more. Yes. In the case of Dark Souls 3, I would have preferred fewer but more unique weapons, something more akin to Bloodborne. In Armored Core 6, I'd simply prefer if the unique options got the same treatment as everything else. Armored Core is not the game where you go small but quality. I don't want to remove and simplify anything. I want the opposite. I want more player choice, more customization, more parts. I want six quad legs, three wheelchair types, three sleds, four traditional tank legs. I want three types of coral missiles, two types of Gatling guns, three types of explosive thrower melee weapons, and so on. My issue is that some tools get the expanded treatment and others do not. I want all of the other interesting, unique weapons to have the scale, the scale of fire only a tiny bit because low EN load and low weight, and fire a ton because high EN load and high weight. I want that range, the missile launcher range for everything. And it might sound selfish of me to ask this, but Armor Core's whole deal has been massive customization to a jaw-dropping degree, and it's just not as present in this game unlike the previous titles. Still, 
it does have some of the best physical customization for your mechs I have seen. The customization with all of the colors, where you put your decals, it's fantastic. And it does exactly what I wanted it to do, which is make amazing looking ACs and extreme internet shitpost ACs. It's all lovely. And because of that, even though I just went on a whole thing about weapon variety types and stuff, I still love making a mech. And so I thought maybe I could show you five of my favorite mechs I've been working on. <laughs> First one, Torch Bearer. It's a flame heavy version of a bipedal AC. It's a combo of the flamethrower, napalm thrower, laser turret, and soup missiles. The idea is that it's a close range area control mech that picks a single zone and makes it death. Burn the ground, cover it with laser turrets, and then always hit people with the flamethrower. And if they try running away, the soup is to have that extra damage and deal with anyone trying to kite you. It's a really fun one. I'm really proud of just the overall way it looks. And it puts out more damage than you'd expect. Number two, Anglerfish. It's a heavy tank mech that's basically a never ending stream of plasma and coral fire, so long as you can maintain your overheats well. It's a bit of a challenging mech to use and requires a lot of prepping the right weapons to be fully charged or spammed, but when done right, it puts out ungodly damage. The coral rifle, plasma rifle, coral missile, and plasma missiles together give it flexibility for being such a low to the ground mech, and you'll probably out damage your opponent with the amount of HP you have. It's the right way to fire the missiles, charge the right thing, charge the right gun, make sure you don't overheat. It's very technical, but if you get it right, there's a good chance you'll just out damage anyone you deal with with that 18,000 HP. Number three, Turntable. It's a hyper lightweight mech that combines ballistics on one arm and laser fire on the other arm. Handgun and gun orbit with laser handgun and laser orbit. Together, they leave you with this hyper mobile quick boost machine that puts out a lot of consistent Distant firepower where the only downtime is when your orbits overheat, which can be easily managed with intelligent usage. It's not an insta kill or anything, but the idea is death by a thousand cuts while giving you the tools to dodge what the enemy throws at you. I was considering calling it Wasp because it literally feels like you're just always spinning around them all the time, stinging them, but turntable sounded cooler of the idea of going with two different kinds of laser and ballistics. Number four is Overdraft because he's depositing checks your ass can't cash. It's a hyper aggressive AC that is all about constant pressure. Double vertical missiles with a sweet 16 and laser blade along with the melee bonus parts. It's a constant amount of boosting into your enemy, firing missiles at them, and then hitting them with that sweet 16 and laser blade in a flurry. It's entirely about unrelenting pressure being put on your opponent. And while it does lose a lot to long range builds, it's super fun. Boost in 16, melee, missiles, the whole thing boost again, melee again. Just never let your opponent take an inch. It's a lot of fun. And finally, number five, holding pattern. It's a quad leg AC that combines the biggest grenade launcher I can, the long term shield, and the Gatling gun plus plasma missiles. This build still needs some tuning right now, but I think it has the legs. Uh, to be really effective. It's basically keeping the shield up as long as you can for serious damage mitigation, all the while peppering down the enemy with missiles and the Gatling gun. The blast radius of the grenade launcher is so huge that when you fire it from above, it'll probably hit the ground even if they attempt to dodge and the giant radius will end up hitting them anyway. But firing it drops the shield. So you either fire it to stagger or when staggered for big damage, and then you put the shield right back up. It needs a little tuning. I, I might change the plasma missiles for something else, but it's a load of fun for me, not them. It's infuriating to fight. I really like these five builds because they're not just fun for PVP, but they're also generally usable in PVE as well. A lot of them have enough of like a non gimmick build to the point where you can actually run these in PVE and do pretty well in some of the ranks. Now, granted, taking these to PVP has been interesting. I know you could probably swap out a few parts, change a few little bits and pieces of the mech and still end up having probably a better mech because I'm not always great at building these mechs, but I'm also not a very good PVP player either, I'll admit. So sometimes these mechs can do a lot of work, but then sometimes I feel like again, this rock, paper, scissors style scenario where just whatever the opponent brings is something I just cannot deal with. And I get 
kind of hard counter. The PvP for Armored Core has become really enjoyable. It is an interesting way to just stress test ACs. The fight clubs are fun. Seeing what your friends put together and the abominations they create is always hilarious. But I don't think it's unfair to ask for a bit more of a streamlined PvP system. Like this, this feels almost like a fighting game, the way there's one-on-one -on -one matches go. And I kind of wish we could just find a match and instantly get into a game with the option of rematch and change AC. It would streamline a lot of the process. And I don't know why, but this is a particularly annoying issue that I find with a lot of Japanese games. The multiplayer systems are almost always a bit convoluted for no real reason. I mean, Nintendo is a huge contributor to this problem, but I don't think it would kill them to just put a simple fine match Q button. And I guess this kind of goes a little bit against the idea of Armored Core, but you know me, I'm a progression kind of guy. I like XP, I like leveling up. I wouldn't mind an AC level that's just kind of like your arena level, but instead for the nest, it'd be kind of fun. Some Kind of rank system for it. I mean, being a good AC pilot is a major part of Armored Core lore and story. There's a reason why the V1 Freud fight is so underwhelming because he just kind of shows up and he's the guy v1 and then you just kind of trounce him because this fight isn't really that interesting being a really good ac pilot it is a thing it's important in the story so having some kind of level would be pretty nice don't you think i would have loved some way to show off that i'm a really good pvp player in armory core you know some type of system i don't know how it is but anything would be lovely Wow, Armored Core. It is a insanely good game. I've got my problems with it, as I've mentioned, but nothing that I've said or complained about in this video truly overtakes the, uh, the sheer enjoyment I have with this game. It's fully my game of the year. Again, I have not played Baldur's Gate, and as a massive Mass Effect simp, I probably will like Baldur's Gate more. But at the moment, Armored Core, like, it doesn't even come close. No other game this year at all has whatsoever hit me this hard. It is so rare that I enjoy a game to this degree, to this amount, to 100% it, to platinum it, to whatever it is. Armored Core 6 is incredible. I'm pretty harsh when it comes to, like, well, review scores are stupid, but Armored Core 6, if they had a little tweak to the endings, a few more parts, and a more streamlined multiplayer system, I would almost consider calling it like a 10 out of 10 or damn close. Like, I have very few complaints. It is a monumental feat how good this game is after how long it has been. I don't believe FromSoft said they were going to do any kind of DLC, or at least they didn't have anything in the process, then the pipeline. Just... You gave me a crap load of new weapons, couple story missions, like 20 bucks in a heartbeat. I'd buy that in a heartbeat. I love this game. I love this game. It is so much fun. I have an absolute blast. And for those of you who are playing it, those of you who are like Armored Core fans like me, I think we're eating well, right? We are eating so good. I did not expect something like this to come out and to be this quality. That's what I got for you today. That's the video. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you stay hydrated with air up. <sighs> Link in the description. Thank you for sponsoring this video. If you wanna get some merchandise, Just a Little Siege right here is available in the link in the description. I will place it right there, orchidate.com. It'll take you straight to this shirt page so you don't need to search for it and all that fun jazz. That's all you got for me. I will see you in the next video, probably still in October. We might talk about the Dark Tide and the new Dark Tide update. It's a rarity that I do update videos, but uh, it's a thing. Thank you, have a good one. Appreciate your support. Come on. Obviously, you're a skater.